Hello and welcome to the National Television Network's live sitting of today's House of Assembly, live broadcast of today's House of Assembly sitting from the Government Information Service. I am Alicia Ali. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, remember, you can catch us live on the Government of St. Lucia's Facebook page as well as our YouTube page and on www.govt.lc. It is the 27th of June and we're here at the House of Parliament on Library Street in Castries. We are awaiting the arrival of the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honorable Leon Theodore John. On. The order paper for today looks quite extensive um, with a few motions, actually four motions down for consideration. The first is that amendment, an amendment is being proposed to Schedule 3 of the Value Added Tax Act, which speaks to the import of goods and services by the St. Lucia Association for Persons with Development Disabilities, Incorporated, and the Child Development and Guidance Center. Uh, the second motion down for consideration is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to raise 103 million EC dollars for financing the 2017-2018 budget and also that uh, the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance raised a sum of $262 million for refinancing the existing debts on the regional government securities market or through private placements at a maximum rate of 7.5%. The Sergeant at Arms is carrying the mace and he is followed by Speaker of the House of Assembly and the Deputy Clerk of Parliament. This signals the beginning of today's proceedings, so let's head down to the chamber floor. Let us pray. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we, thine unworthy servants, here gathered together in thy name, do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above to direct and guide us in all our consultations. And grant that we, having thy fear always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affection, the result of all our counsels, may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the queen, the public will, peace, and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in the true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us forevermore. Amen. Announcements. I am in receipt of communication, a letter of apology from the Honorable Member for Babano, informing that he is currently out of state and apologizes for his absence from this today's sitting. I wish to inform Honorable Members that I headed a delegate to Jamaica to participate in to participate in a conference, a regional conference regarding the eradication of AIDS in the Caribbean region. And that was held on the 30th and 31st of May 2017. Uh, I think um, the, actually our Honorable Minister for, of Health was present, was part of the delegation, and there was quite a bit to be learned and gleaned in terms of dealing with AIDS 
the pandemic and how we as a nation can move forward in that regard as well. Honorable members, I wish to remind you that I would like to meet with members of this Honorable House immediately following today's proceedings for a rather informal meeting of the members of the House. There are much needed things regarding uh, House members and um, procedures, safety, security to be discussed, and I would like to meet with members in a private setting, not in a public forum such as this. Statements by ministers. Papers to be laid. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, the Public Service, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 47 of 2017, excise tax amendment of schedule one order. Statutory instrument number 50 of 2017, fiscal incentives, Tenderoni Foods Incorporated order. Statutory instrument number 52 of 2017, legal profession, eligibility, Shireen Stephanie Francis order. Statutory instrument number 53, sorry, 50, 53 of 2017, legal profession, eligibility, Villette Gisela Benjamin, order. Statutory number, instrument number 55 of 2017, plan of arrangement, BICO Act, commencement order. Report of the Director of Audit for the fiscal year 2000. 15, 2016. Honorable Minister for Infrastructure, Port, Energy, and Labor. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the following papers standing in my name. St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority Annual Report 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism, information and broadcasting. Madam Speaker, I wish to uh lay the following paper standing in my name. Uh, statutory instrument number 51 of 2017, Tourist Duty Free Shopping System Royalton, St. Lucia Lim Limited Order. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for commerce, industry, enterprise development and consumer affairs. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 36A of 2017, price control amendment number six order. Statutory instrument number 48 of 2017, price control amendment number seven order. Statutory instrument number 49 of 2017, price control and amendment number eight order. Statutory instrument number 54 of 2017, price control amendment number nine order. Motions. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, the Public Service, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following motion standing in my name. Be it resolved, whereas under Section 1091A of the Value Added Tax Act, Cap 15.42, 
of the Act, it is provided that the Minister responsible for Finance may, by order published in the Gazette, amend the schedules to the Act. And whereas it is further provided under Section 109.2 of the Act that an order made pursuant to Section 109.1 of the Act is subject to an affirmative resolution of Parliament, except where the amendment is to the customs tariff headings only. And whereas the Minister responsible for Finance seeks to approval of the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, order to amend Schedule 3 of the Act by affirmative resolution of Parliament. Be it resolved that the Parliament by affirmative resolution approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3 order which amends Schedule 3 of the Act. Honourable Members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3 order, which amends Schedule 3 of the Act. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, um, this is a, a very simple uh, motion. Um, what we're looking to do, as required uh, by the regulations is to provide um, a waiver of the value added tax for two um, agencies and that is the parliament authorizes the minister of finance to make a value added tax amendment order to exempt the import of goods and services by the saint lucia association for persons with development disabilities incorporated and the child development and guidance center incorporated I think it's a very simple uh, amendment and I'm hoping it meets with the approval of Parliament. Honorable Members, the question is that Parliament by affirmative, affirmative resolution approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3 order which amends Schedule 3 of the Act. I now put the question. As many are as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following motion standing in my name. Whereas it is provided by Section 3 of the National Savings and Development Bonds Act, Cap 15.25, that under the authority of Parliament, the Minister responsible for finance may raise by the issue of savings bonds inside and outside St. Lucia money up to the amount of $1.8 billion for financing such capital or other expenditure and for such debt refinancing as he or she may determine. And whereas it is further provided by Section 4 of the National Savings and Development Bonds Act, Cap 15.25, that the bonds shall be issued in such form and on such terms and conditions as the Minister responsible for finance may direct. And whereas the Minister responsible for finance deems it necessary to raise a sum of EC $103 million dollars for financing the 2017-2018 budget, a sum of $262 million for refinancing the existing debts on the regional government securities market or through private placements at a maximum rate of 7.5%. Be it resolved that the Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to raise the sum of EC 103 million for financing the 2017-2018 budget, a sum of 262 million for refinancing the existing debts and the regional government securities market through the private placements at a maximum rate of 7.5%. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to raise 
A, the sum of $103 million for financing the 2017-2018 budget, B, a sum of EC $262 million for refinancing the existing debts of the regional government securities market or through private placements at a maximum rate of 7.5%. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, this is a part of the budgetary process as indicated um, that we have an approval of $1.8 billion in terms of financing available to the government for capital and for uh, re refinancing. At this point, we're simply requesting that we allow to borrow the $103 million uh, in order to be able to finance the budget as indicated in the budget we just recently passed through the appropriations bill. And that a further sum of $262 million, Madam Speaker, in order to be able to refinance existing loans that we have, so in terms of turning over those loans. I hope that this meets with the approval of Parliament. Honorable Leader of the Opposition and Member for Castries, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it's unfortunate that we have, we here more than 60 days after the passing of the budget to deal with something that we could have done 60 days ago. But, be, but due to the adjournment of the House for 40 days and 40 nights, we found ourselves in a position where we have to deal with something we could have dealt with a long time ago. But Madam Speaker, I have a fundamental problem with the motion as read by the Honorable Minister, Minister for Finance. And my, and my point of departure is the, budgetary, the budget summary that gave life to the budget address read by the Honorable Minister for Finance. In the budget summary, Madam Speaker, and you will note that the budget is a deficit budget, a deficit of over $220 million, is the largest deficit budget we've had for quite a while, over 4%. And it's also, it also shows an uh, increase in all the deficits, primary deficits, all the deficits increase, Madam Speaker. So that we had an overall deficit of $220 million, even with an increase in the fuel tax of 60% from 250 to four dollars causing the price of fuel to increase by 60 percent per gallon because of the taxes an increase in the airport tax of 152 percent again causing the cost of travel to increase we still had a deficit budget of 220 million dollars and we haven't even included financing for the airports which is supposed to be $150 million because the government has abandoned the PVP option. So this is the scenario in which I will discuss the motion as outlined by the Prime Minister. The financing for the, for the budget proposals, Madam Speaker, is actually $345,431.20 $431,227. That is the financing for the budget. As compared to the last financial year, where the financing was $185 million. So the government has increased the loans by over $200 million this year. And that's still, we're still with a deficit budget of $220 million. But Madam Speaker, the Minister of Finance is asking the, the parliament to approve $103 million for financing of this budget. Now, if he's asking for $103 million, where will he get the money to continue to finance the other projects of the government? Because the money he's asking to borrow 
doesn't even cover the overall deficit that he has. $220 million deficit, but he's asking to borrow $103 million. So, Madam Speaker, you find that there must be something. The Minister of Finance must return to his honorable house to borrow more money. Because it's just, it's just simple common sense. If he needs $245 million to finance this budget. And, Madam Speaker, I want you to do a simple bit of arithmetic. Very simple. If you look at the total expenses of the budget for this year, and we can, again, my point of departure is the budget summary, you will see that the total expenditure for this year is $1.5 billion. I just want to round it up. And the total income is $1.1 billion. So there is a deficit, a total deficit of $255 million. And that is, that is exactly the financing that he's asking for in the budget summary, the $355 billion. He's asking for $345 billion. If you look at last year, you will see that the total expenses were $1.3 billion. Total income, $1.1 billion. The, the total deficit, $185 million and the financing was $195 million, which is basically the same as, as last year. But this year, he's asking for only for $103 million. Where will he raise the remainder of the money? He, he has to return to his honorable house to borrow, to borrow more money. And, I'm, and it's, it gets even more serious, Madam Speaker, because the second part of the motion he says it's to refinance existing debt. I'd like the Honorable Minister of Finance to give me a list of the existing debt that he is refinancing. Because again, Madam Speaker, if you look at the social and economic review, you will see that the last time they refinanced debt or they roll over debt, the debt was on, on page 54 of the S social and economic review, you will see they rolled over. $705 million worth of debt. This year he's saying to us that he only wants $262 million to roll over debt. Now, Madam Speaker, let me tell you what the roll over debt means. It means that, suppose it's very simple. You have some money in the bank, and the bank gives you interest. So you say to the bank, pay me the interest, and you hold my money. That's simple, simply what a roll over of debt means. He had to roll over, according to the documents in the Ministry of Finance, $705 million worth of debt for the year 2015-2016. But this year, he's saying that he only wants $252 or $262 million to roll over debt. There is something wrong, Madam Speaker. There, there must be something wrong. And the Minister of Finance, if he is so minded, he may not be, will have to explain in simple, in simple economic terms, in simple numbers, why with a deficit of $220 million and needing $345 million to balance his budget, he's coming to the parliament only to borrow $103 million. There must be something wrong, Madam Speaker. So the Prime Minister will have to tell us, if he's so minded, what debts is he refinancing that are worth $262 million? Whereas the SEC says it's over $700 million worth of debt which he has to refinance. But, Madam Speaker, it gets even more interesting because in this budget, the, the Honorable Prime Minister said to us that that is a growth budget. That will create employment. That will create jobs. And part of the examples he used is Ojo Labs. So, Madam Speaker, I was wondering, and by the Prime Minister's own explanation. He was on a plane going to, to, to speak to American Airlines. I know that. I've done that trip with him in another, in another world. We have to go and speak to, to, to American Airlines, a fellow called Mr. Dilara. But Dilara isn't there again. So I, I know about that trip. So he went to speak to Mr. The American Airlines. And why he was there? He, he, flew, he flew to Austin, Texas. When he went to Austin, Texas, he met a guy. The guy said, you come on, come on, let's chat. He says, right away, I agree. 
I'm going to give you $4 million and want to refit the factory for you. I'm going to pay your staff for you. But Madam Speaker, there was no review, you know. When is the nice workers? They have a review. When is St. Lucian's nice workers? There's a review. There's a minister of investment. There's a minister, there's the invest in Lucia. No discussion. The prime minister, running the government like a business, decides that he's going to take $4 million and refit a factory for a gentleman. But I looked further. And I wondered why he was the prime minister doing that. Because the prime minister must have a motive. And he spoke about artificial intelligence. And I want you to research artificial intelligence, Madam Speaker. And research, research artificial intelligence and see what's, that's, what is that all about. Artificial intelligence is a new, a new, a new phenomenon that deals with several things, including the mind, including mind bending, data analytics. And that has been used in the politics in the region. That has been used in the politics in the region. So when the Prime Minister, and Madam Speaker, when you, when you say these things, I always tell him, all of you all can go and Google. Go Google artificial intelligence. Google it. Google it and see what it's all about. It's not me saying that, you know. It deals with several things. It's a new phenomenon. There are benefits and there are downsides. But part of it, I repeat, is data analytics that has been used in political campaigning in the region. So I'm saying to myself, the Prime Minister was so enthusiastic in speaking to Ojo Labs. He was so enthusiastic, so enthusiastic that he, by his own admission, agreed that he would give the man $1,000 per employee. Nobody knows how many employees. No review like the nice workers or St. Jude's Hospital. No, no analysis from, from, from the Ministry of, of, of Investment. But the cabinet agrees, Madam Speaker. There must be something more than employment. How many people are, are going to be employed? How many people are going to be employed at, at Ojo Labs? And why must a factory, why must we use $5 million of the money that we are going to borrow to finance Ojo Labs? The answer, and you might call me cynical, but my experience with this government causes me to be cynical. There must be, there must be something because artificial intelligence deals with mind bending. Look for the campaign. Because no one knows what's happening there. And I want you to research it. And you will find out what's happening there, Madam Speaker. And again, the Prime Minister was in, in a party with his bow tie, and he said, Oh, I met some lady, and I told her to go and open some school for me. And I'm happy that she opened it. In effect, he said that, in effect. And you don't know what, what, what that, that, that meant, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker? That meant another $5 million for hospitality training, in effect. But Madam Speaker, if you say anything, they tell you, you now know that. And that is what, and they tell you, you, you are power, you want to be in power. But that, these are facts, Madam Speaker. Ten million dollars of the money that we, are, that we are going to borrow, one of them in a plane from Texas, the other one in effect. That is the analysis, Madam Speaker, that we put into government's decision in St. Lucia. But, Madam Speaker, further, further, even, Madam Speaker, and I'm going to put it to you, that the increase in fuel taxes by 60%, is one of the highest tax increases ever in the history of St. Lucia's political and economic development. One dollar and the increase from 250 to $4 is one of the highest increases. And we will see, Madam Speaker, because you know, when you say these things, they always believe that you're imp you imputing improper motives and they go all over the, all over the place instead of coming back to the reality and to the facts. Even to tell you that St. Lucians won't worry about that because they have to buy $20 gas. So they don't care about that. So they, even the price go up by $150, they don't care because they buy $20 gas. These are the excuses we make, Madam Speaker. But, Madam Speaker, because of the excesses of this government, I am putting it to you that we have to return to this honorable house to borrow money to finance 
the 2017 2018 budget. Because this motion, as it stands, is not enough. It cannot finance it. And the Prime Minister should come and say to the House that the amount which is asking, which the motion speaks to, which is 103 and 262, which is $365 million, is to finance this budget and not to refinance any existing debt. It is to refinance this budget because he cannot. And I defy him to give me a list of the debts that he is refinancing for $250. Because if you look at the social and economic review and you look at the debts, the debts that are maturing in 2017, you will see it comes to a lot less, a lot more than $250. $52 million. And if you look at page 54 of the review of the economy, and I quote, during the review period, 465.7 million in treasury bills and 239 million of bullet bonds matured and were rolled over. Therefore, the principal repayments made towards amortized bonds and loans increased to 46.4 million in 2016. So this motion, Madam Speaker, to my mind, is fundamentally flawed, or it doesn't serve to tell this, the entire story of the state of the economy based on the budget summary and based on the budget statement which was delivered by the Prime Minister. It's, it's common sense. A 220, 220 million deficit budget cannot be financed only by $103 million of, $103 million of loans. Impossible. So the Prime Minister must tell us where he's getting the money from and how he intends to finance his budget, to finance his Ojo Labs, etc. Where he's getting the money from to finance it. Because this motion cannot finance a budget as stated by the Honorable Prime Minister. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member for Viewfort South. Madam Speaker, I understand that we are looking at the resolution which in essence requests Parliament to approve a sum of our EC 103 million for financing the 2017-2018 budget and a sum of 262 million dollars for refinancing the existing debts on the regional government securities market or through private placements at a maximum rate of 7.5 percent. At the outset, Madam Speaker, I want to admit, of course, that I understand full well the desire of any Minister of Finance, having just passed the budget, to try and get approval for all borrowings up front, either during or immediately after, so that you don't have a recurring decimal of constant resolutions before the House in the course of the year requesting approval for borrowing. I mean, certainly this is a procedure that has been employed in the past before, and one understands perfectly why this would be the case even on this occasion. However, Madam Speaker, I am very mystified by the resolution that is before the House this morning. It is an unusually crafted resolution. And to be frank, Madam Speaker, I am not even sure in my mind <coughs> that the correct procedures have been employed in presenting this resolution to the Honorable House. You see, Madam Speaker, we seem to be dealing with borrowing from two different sources. And it would be necessary for the Minister of Finance to clarify exactly how he is proceeding 
because of the sums of money that are involved here. On the one hand, the Minister of Finance cites the National Savings and Development Bonds Act and indicates that there will be some borrowing, but we are not told precisely what is the amount that will be protected, be allowed under the National Savings and Development Bonds Act. Then in paragraph B, it says a sum of EC 262 million for refinancing the existing debts on the regional government securities market or through private placements at a maximum, maximum rate of 7.5%. There are two kinds of instruments that may be placed before the RGSM. The first is the usual treasury bills. And then, of course, you can seek to finance bonds placed on the RGSM. Here again, we are not being told what amount of money is going to be raised by way of treasury bills, what amount of money is going to be raised by way of bonds. This becomes crucial because then we are dealing with the issue of interest rates. If you are raising money by way of treasury bills, then very clearly, there's a certain interest rate that will apply to treasury bills. If you are going to raise money by way of bonds, then if you're going to go by way of bonds of a certain duration, whether it is short term or long term bonds, there's going to be a certain interest rate that is applicable. But the mystery continues because, Madam Speaker, if the intention is that all this money is going to be raised under the National Savings and Development Bonds Act, because it is cited, I note, in paragraphs one and two, then the Minister of Finance must perforce clarify what amount of money is really being raised under the National Savings and Development Bonds Act, because there's a ceiling. You could only borrow up to $1.8 billion. Therefore, the question is, what is the current ceiling? How much we have outstanding in bonds? And secondly, if both amounts are to be protected under the National Savings Development Bonds Act, then would the existing ceiling be able to accommodate both instruments? So there must be frank and full disclosure of precisely what room you have to maneuver under the National Savings and Development Bonds Act. One would have thought that precisely because two different kinds of legislation authorizes two different kinds of interventions that the Minister of Finance would have made it absolutely clear in a resolution before the House, what amount is coming from national savings development bonds, what amount is coming under treasury bills. There is a further implication, and I'm not so sure, and I will not offer any opinion on this question now for a variety of reasons whether even if you borrow, borrow under the National Savings Development Bonds Act and you enter into agreements with specific banks or institutions or individuals as to how much you're borrowing, whether you don't have to come back to the house in respect of those specific instruments because you'll be borrowing at specific rates of interest. Or unless, of course, you have a generous investor who says, well, I'm going to take all your debt buy all your debt, <coughs> and the rate of interest is 7.5%. So I would hope that we get some clarification of this because this instrument is ill-advised as it is drafted. I will say no more on this. I mean, at this stage, because, as I said, we are dealing with two very different species. 
But what is causing me some concern is a lack of, of clarity in respect of interest rates. Madam Speaker, this resolution clearly suggests that St. Lucia has to make its instruments available in the marketplace. But there are some very interesting things that are happening on the RGSM. St. Lucia is in a peculiar position because a lot of its debt is actually debt on the RGSM, contrary to what most people think. And precisely because you're dealing with a lot of that debt on the RGSM, it is always more difficult to engage in any kind of renegotiation regarding that specific debt. <clears throat> but the trends that we are seeing today are not trends that happen today alone, but they are some ominous signals. Because having <coughs> managed an economy <coughs> in the last few years, and having experienced the pressures that were exerted on St. Lucia in the last few years, it is even more critical and crucial that we understand the vulnerabilities we are dealing with at this time. The fact of the matter is that St. Lucia is attracting the highest rates of interest with instruments for its instruments on the, on the RGSM. Now, there is both a positive and a negative side to this. At first glance, an investor, including an ordinary St. Lucia, would want to buy the instruments of the government of St. Lucia, your treasury bills, because it is offering an interest rate of 6%. After all, banks are not offering that kind of interest rate, so you might as well invest in government securities. That's a short-term benefit. The long-term issue and the underlying structural issue is that your instruments are attracting higher rates of interest because your economy is under stress. And let us look at some of these placements to grasp the significance of this. The Government of St. Lucia Treasury Bill issued on the 28th of June, 25 million. The rate of interest suggested to the market maximum, 60% for 180 days. The Government of Antigua issues Treasury Bills for maximum 15 million. The rate of interest proposed by Antigua for Treasury bills of 365 days, 5.5%. And bearing in mind that this is an economy that came out of a partial form of structural adjustment and it seems well on its way to be facing further stresses. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they went to the market for $28 million Interest rate, 4.82%. 91 days, Treasury bills. The government of the Commonwealth of Dominica, they too went to the market, 20 million, and the interest rate, 6%. The government of Grenada, now under a structural adjustment program, and they have had more room to maneuver to deal with their debt, for the simple reason most of their debt was external or externally incurred, they are going to the market for 10 million only at an interest rate of 4%. So what do we see here? We are seeing a pattern that the economies that are under stress are selling their instruments at the highest rates of interest on our RGSM. That's a warning signal. That is a warning signal. And the question which the Minister of Finance has to answer, what advice do you give investors in that kind of environment? 
What do you tell your investors? What explanations are you going to tell them? Well, you know, we are offering higher rates of interest because we can afford it. Is that the advice? Or, on the other hand, some investors more discerning say, look, 6%, I better be careful down the road. That's the issue. It now becomes an issue of confidence in respect of the financial system. Madam Speaker, there was, I thought, a statement by the Minister of Finance in his budget presentation that on the face of it looked rather innocuous. I thought it was a very unusual statement for a Minister of Finance to make. And it's at page 38 of his budget speech, now part of the record of this House. He says, quote, Madam Speaker, to solve the debt problem, we will have to do our fair share as a government and as a people. We cannot do it alone. To restore the public finances, we must recognize that our fiscal stability is a shared interest for all stakeholders in our economy. <clears throat> we will have to act in partnership with the private sector and with our bilateral and multilateral stakeholders. The burden of adjustment will have to be shared by all. Over the next few months, we plan to announce several initiatives which we believe are necessary to place our debt on a sustainable path. This is a very interesting and surprising statement. As I said, unless you read the budget very carefully, you may not have picked up the implications or the nuances of that statement. The question is, why would the Minister of Finance make a statement like this when he knows he has to go to the marketplace? What is the hidden message contained in that statement? What are you telling investors who wish to purchase government instruments, government bonds, government securities? What are you telling them? Are you telling them that down the road they may face the possibility of a haircut? Or are you telling them down the road that they may have to face the possibility of renegotiation of their government instruments? What are you telling them? And why would you want to say that at this time? What are you to tell someone who comes to you for advice and say, I have a million dollars, I want to buy government <coughs> treasury bills, or I want to buy bonds, should I go ahead? What do you tell them? You can tell them, these are the market conditions, these are the interest rates that are available. These are the interest rates that are applicable. But you should be careful and be aware of the statement made by the Minister of Finance that sometime in this budgetary cycle there will be negotiations in respect of outstanding debt to the government of St. Lucia. That is what the advisor may have to offer by way of advice. The fact of the matter is, Madam Speaker, as I have indicated, on the one hand, it may appear attractive to buy instruments at the rate of, of 6% because it is the highest rate being offered, certainly far higher than our counterparts in the rest of the region. But it begs the question, why is it that St. Lucia's instruments are attracting such high rates of interest? Why? Clearly, this is a portfolio that will have to be handled with extraordinary care and sensitivity as we proceed in this coming budgetary cycle. And very clearly, what we choose to say is going to be vital as we manage that portfolio 
in the weeks and months ahead. In summary, therefore, Madam Speaker, I seek answers to the following questions. Whether legally you can proceed to borrow sums of money from two government acts in one resolution without reference to specific acts and the amount of money being raised under each act, whether you can do this. Secondly, whether you can proceed to ask Parliament for its blessing in an open-ended manner, notwithstanding the fact that certainly in respect of the National Savings Development Bonds Act, you have greater room to maneuver. There's no question, because there's a two-stage process. The first is that the National Development Savings Bond Act must establish a ceiling for you to borrow. And once you indicate you are issuing bonds under that, then the second stage applies. The borrowing and the rates of interest have to be clarified, especially if you are engaged in borrowing for long-term <coughs> instruments. That is the, the, the second issue that has to be clarified. And the third issue, why is it that St. Lucia is attracting at this stage such a high rate of interest? And for how long are we to expect those rates of interest will continue to apply? Madam Speaker, I thank you and say no more. Honorable, Honorable Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Aviation. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I will speak in support of this resolution made by the Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, in this Honorable House, Sometimes you listen to members' contributions, and you'd think that's the first time they come to the Honorable House to make a presentation. Madam Speaker, I heard there must be motive, as indicated by the member for Castries East, for the borrowing and the setting up of Ojo Labs I heard the member for Viewfort South speaking about clarity, speaking about the need to declare everything so that we can understand. Madam Speaker, these two members who have spoken are among the longest serving members in this honorable house. Couldn't burn me. If I had to be the longest serving member and that was my performance, I'd rather be out from today. So, so at the end of the day, it is not how much time you spend, it is what you do with the time that you spend in this honorable house. And so, Madam Speaker, I will take us back to remind some people in this honorable house of their own tenure in office because apparently some of them have forgotten what they did in their time. And so, Madam Speaker, we look at the resolution and we hear about 7% interest. And we think that 7% interest is out of this world. But Madam Speaker, when we lost the 2011 elections and the Labour Party came into office, one of my challenges to them was to maintain the credit rating that St. Lucia had. And that was one of the first things we lost under them, the, our credit rating. Because the cost of borrowing is driven up by 
the level of rating that your country has. But Madam Speaker, I will take them back to a resolution and I'm quoting from a document that is already a document of the House. Madam Speaker, the report of the Commission of Inquiry on Rochamel. And let me read a resolution, Madam Speaker. Whereas it is provided by Section 39 of the Finance Administration Act 1997, number three, that the Minister of Finance may by resolution of Parliament borrow from any bank or other financial institution for capital or recurrent expenditure of government. And whereas it is further provided by Section 42 of the said Act that there shall be a charge upon and paid out of the consolidated fund debt charges for which the government is liable. And whereas the Minister for Finance considers it necessary to enter into a fully underwritten fixed rate bond facility of 41 million US or its equivalent in Eastern Caribbean dollars at an issue price of 100% par value with the RBTT Merchant Bank, the purpose of the financing is for government capital program and refinancing of government's obligations to the former Hyatt Hotel. And it goes on to say, and whereas the interest on this facility is fixed at 7.75%. I'll stop there. That's not all of the resolution. But I want to make a point here, Madam Speaker. What was the clarity? The member for Viewfort South is coming to the Honorable House and saying, oh, and that's what he does all the time, Madam Speaker. Try to cause people to second guess what they are doing in this house because he comes and he presents himself. Oh, I have that concern, but I'm not very clear. If you're not clear, don't say anything. When you're clear, speak. When you're not clear, don't come and give us instructions on what to do. Because, Madam Speaker, that is the game that is being played. So I'm not clear if the resolution can do both. So trying to raise doubt. You are clear on what you are doing with Rochamel? But the house was not clear. The house was not clear. Because all you gave in your explanation was to finance obligations to Hyatt. And when the then members of the opposition tried to ask questions, there were no answers given. I can give other examples, Madam Speaker. I had a big debate about people didn't get a chance to speak in the last budget. Madam Speaker, I realize they're trying to capitalize on the opportunity to speak, but the opportunity is gone already. You can talk. The budget is passed already. At the end of the day, Madam Speaker, they were given 40 days. So apparently, they need 40 years to prepare to respond to what is there. But Madam Speaker, when we look at what has happened and how I heard them talk about they were building this economy, you are managing. He said he was managing the economy. Madam Speaker, they were destroying the economy. They were not managing the economy. There's nothing in their performance that shows me that there was management. And I will substantiate my point by the things that I will highlight. But Madam Speaker, when they want to tell us about, oh, I will not take advice over them, Madam Speaker, because they couldn't advise themselves what to do when they were in government. But all of a sudden, they have all the answers to everything. They know how to borrow, but they didn't know how to borrow when they were in government. Or else they knew and they pretended that they didn't know. So, Madam Speaker, talking about procedures, what happened in the last budget debate of the St. Lucia Labour Party as the government of St. Lucia? We heard we couldn't debate about some members on this side didn't get to speak, and they were concerned about that. Ask them, Madam Speaker, 
How did they pass the appropriation bill in the last budget? And I wanted to go on the record in this country that when they talk about procedures, they came in, Madam Speaker, they said two debates. There used to be one debate, okay. We went with two debates. For that matter, I was even questioned. What do you have to say now that the document was given? Madam Speaker, you know what happened the last budget debate of the Labour Party in the House? There was no policy statement. There was no speech by the Prime Minister. But you know what he did? He passed the appropriation bill overnight. And I want you to tell me that's not true. I want you to tell me the procedures you want to tell us to follow. Why you did not follow the procedures when you were the Minister of Finance. That is, you see, that is how things must be measured, Madam Speaker. We cannot use one measurement when this government is in office and another measurement when the other government is there. Madam Speaker, not until the postponement of the last debate did I realize that the appropriation bill in the last budget just before the elections of the Labour Party did not go through the procedure, the established procedure that they are talking about. Convention. Convention. He did not go through that. He did not come and read a speech of his policy statements and give us an opportunity to debate. Today, the leader of the opposition, the so-called leader of the opposition, because he's not the leader of the opposition. He just has the name. Madam Speaker, when, when they want to come and tell us what to do and how to do it, I've always said, if you are not going to lead by example, do not instruct others on what to do. So we're talking about procedures. So they did not follow that procedure. The details of the borrowing on the Rochamel was never given and has never been given. This, the, the former Minister of Finance, Commissioner of Inquiry, he didn't speak. A lawyer spoke on his behalf. Every opportunity he has had in this house to clarify what was the deal with Rochamel, he has never done it. All they speak about is the hotel is there and there are people working. All of us know that the hotel is there. And all of us know that people are working. But the 41 million US that was borrowed and part of the payment was in obligations to Rochamel has never been clarified to the people of this country. But you see, Madam Speaker, they will come and they will present themselves that they have all of the answers. Madam Speaker, what caused us to be in that situation that we are in today? And I heard him talk about the short-term instruments. Madam Speaker, when the Labour Party came into office, our rollover debt was every 10 years. Every 10 years, you'd have a full rollover. Now it is down to four and a half years, Madam Speaker. Four and a half years under their management. And Madam Speaker, I came here and I've spoken about that and Hansard will show that in one of the debates I highlighted <coughs> moving from the bonds to the short-term treasury bills and the turnover every 90 days in some instance and six months, how much it accumulated the interest rate under whose watch that happened? That didn't happen under our watch. That happened under their watch, Madam Speaker. But today they will come and tell you about how Antigua is doing and how St. Vincent is doing. Under the United Workers' Party government, this was the leading country within the OECS in all areas of performance. And even when Antigua was a larger economy, under the United Workers' Party, we overtook the size of the economy in Antigua, under the United Workers' Party government. Ask them what they have to show, madam. Ask them what they have to show. Other 
than raising the debt level of this country. And if you measure the level of debt as opposed to the growth in the economy, because, Madam Speaker, what some people don't understand is that borrowing is not the problem. It is what you do with the money that you borrow. Because if there is proper return on investment, paying back your loan is not a problem. But you see, we had all the borrowing. And it's in the CDB report, you know, and the World Bank report highlights that while we had one of the highest rates of tax, we had the lowest returns from government. Because bad managers, that's what bad managers do. It's not how much money you give them to run the business. It is how efficiently and effectively they are able to run the business. And that is their failure. That's why they're on that side of the house, Madam Speaker. And they have not understood that they're on that side of the house, you know. They still think that they are over here. They still want to tell us what to do. Now, I will tell you. Let this government roll out its budget and judge us at the end of this year. I had the member for Castries East talking about they must come back to the house. And as if when, as if when they were there. Now, it's unfortunate that the former member of Viewfort South is not in this house. Because he could have given you every line. How many times you came to the honorable house to borrow during your time. So there are times that you would come to borrow. Of course we have to come back to the house and borrow. That is how government is run. There is always a need. But it is how you manage what you are borrowing. And that is what you all could not do. And you have to understand that. You have to understand your own failures. And do not try to impose your failed policies on people who know how to manage. And every day, Madam Speaker, every day, we want to run the government like a business. That's what we hear. You know the difference, what it is? That a business and business entities, the most successful business entities in the world, are among those who have the strongest social conscience. That they are able to strike a balance between running their business effectively and caring for the community in which they exist. And government operates that way. Government must run effectively or else it will go bankrupt. And that is where you are leading this country, to a state of bankruptcy. Not only bankruptcy of ideas, but bankruptcy in financing. And so, Madam Speaker, when we come to this honorable house, and I heard the member talk about Ojo Labs, and that we are giving a developer, we, we are giving an investor $1,000. I want to set the record straight. The $1,000 is not for the investor. It is for the workers who are going to be St. Lucians. That is what it is for. And if you understood, if you understood your nice program, yes, just like you paid for True Value and the others, that, that, is, that is what it is about. That is what Order, it is about. Please. Order, please. You need to understand. Oh, it's 10 schools you have already. You'll have about more. And it is educating St. Lucians. That is what the difference is. It's not educating people overseas. It's to educate St. Lucians. You can find out who owns it. You don't have to take it from me. And so, Madam Speaker, when we talk about what was happening, what did they promise us under the NICE program? They promised us kind of an apprenticeship program, a training program to help people to get job experience so that they could get a job. Madam Speaker, part of the same formula that they had, but you see they know how to talk, but they don't know how to work. They talk about the things, but they could not implement it. Now a real government, 
is in charge of the affairs of the country and we are implementing the things that you could not implement because we said that some of the components of the NICE program was good. We said it on the platform. And we said what was good, we are going to uphold it. Because we are not a government as they try to claim of victimization. Everything that had flambeau on it, they tried to get rid of it when they were in government. Once it had a semblance of United Workers Party. But when something is good, it is good. It is good for the people of this country. So if they want to challenge, you want to challenge Ojo Labs? You talk about artificial intelligence? You, need, you, you want to talk about artificial intelligence? I would rather have, I would rather have the artificial intelligence paid to St. Lucians than to pay Bob or Robert. But I will come to that in time. Just keep these names in time, in, in mind. Bob or Robert, keep these names in mind and I will come to them in time. And you will understand how much money y'all paid. We will find out how much money y'all paid and how much money we are paid. But you see, you paid your monies to an American. We are paying the monies to the locals. And, and if, you, if you want to challenge me, every one of you sitting on this side with the exception of the member for... Castries South. South. You all were in the cabinet. So you all know what I'm talking about. But I will come in time. I will come in time to deal with it. So Madam Speaker, you see, that is the bluff that we get from this side of the house, Madam Speaker. They do things that they think we don't know. Because we have chosen not to speak yet. So Madam Speaker... They talk, about, they talk about what we are doing with, with Ojo Labs. I will tell them how much money they paid in time to get what I was giving them for free. I gave them all the advice for free. I gave them all the information for free. They didn't want it. They had to go and pay millions to get it. But I'm coming to this. I'm coming to this in good time. So, Madam Speaker, when they talk about when they talk about St. Lucian's getting work, and, and that is what I don't understand about the Labour Party, Madam Speaker. Here is a government who have introduced a program in this country that is going to employ hundreds of young St. Lucians. Now look at where their concern is. And it tells you, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's what the good book says. So here the thinking of the leader of the opposition. Around elections, you will hear about artificial intelligence. But when I bring my phone records to this house, we will know where it came from and why we need artificial intelligence. I will bring it in time, Madam Speaker. I will make it a document of the house so that it will go down in history. It will go down in the, oh, you know they have a draft document of a report. Okay. We come in. You come in good. Continue. Yes, you remember now. And so, Madam Speaker, when they talk about there must be motive, there must be motive, so you think to create jobs for the people, the young people of St. Lucia, where we have almost 45% unemployment, there's motive? Well, that is the best motive that the government can have. To create jobs for the young people of this country. And here is concern, Madam Speaker. Oh, it's mine. It's the mine they're trying to get into. Huh? It's the mind they tried to get into artificial intelligence. But if you have pure things in your mind, you don't have nothing to worry about. Out of the abundance. You know what? You know what the good book says? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if in the heart have good things, you don't have to worry about what's coming out. Why are you worried about what's coming out on artificial intelligence? You afraid of being found out? Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, 
in this discussion that we are having here today. You know, when people want to impart improper motive to, to things that are good for St. Lucia, that is what happens. They get thrown off track. So let me ask them, since they know about motive, I want them to give me an explanation of the motive behind certain arrangements that they went to as a cabinet. And I'm sure they can help me. Madam Speaker, they went into an arrangement with a company called Bo. You know, you talk about... Madam Speaker, they went into that arrangement. There was a housing project going on in River Dory. And, you, and let, let me preface what I'm saying so that you understand the relation to this bill. They are highlighting what we are doing with the money. What, how we going to spend it. Let me tell you how they spend some of the money that put us in the problems that we have to do. So there was that development started in River Dory. 58 acres of land for redevelopment. Project ongoing. <clears throat> Contractor engaged. Roads cut, pipes being run, everything. Government changes. New government comes into office. Refused to pay the contractor. Three million dollars they refused to pay. Madam Speaker. But the most interesting part of this is that when the company entered into a joint venture, and I want them to tell their good friend, their present spokesman, to explain to them, because the initial joint venture agreement was signed when the UWP was in office. So I put all the records on the table. You're not going back and say, that is not what it is. The joint venture was signed back then, <coughs> when the UWP was in office in 2011. It was a joint venture between NHC and Bo. That's a British company. The company paid Madam Speaker $51, 51 EC dollars, to own 51% shares of the joint venture company. But the joint venture had, company had no assets at the time. You know what they did when they came into government, Madam Speaker? They vested the 58 acres of land in River Dory. They vested the 58 acres into the joint venture company. Now the member for Viewfort South, a dollar an acre. So, so the member for Viewfort South talks about procedure. He was the minister of finance. Ask him whether a company can own land in St. Lucia in excess of 50% without having an alien land holding license. But this company, by some magic, through the cabinet, or through the agency responsible, got to be a 51% shareholder of the 58 acres of land in River Dory without an alien land holding license. Now, when I went back and I did the division, Madam Speaker, 51% of 58.276 acres work out to about 29.8. You can round it off 30 acres. So this company became the owner of 30 acres of prime land in River Dory for 51 EC dollars. <coughs> now, you think that if that was it, Madam Speaker, then we are lucky. You know what they did? I have all the invoices here. Madam Speaker, I can make it a document of the House from Peter I. Foster Chambers. I will make it a document of the House, Madam Speaker. That a lawyer, now here the best part, 
After the people got our 30 acres of land for $51, Madam Speaker, they now pay a lawyer, and the lawyer says to them, apparently it's, NHC doesn't have the money that is required, so I want an advance payment for me to represent NHC. Can make it a document of the House, Madam Speaker, so it can go in the record. With reference to your letter dated 5th September 2014, please be advised that the sum of $15,000 requested in our proposed engagement letter is a retainer against which we will bill. The basis for our billing will be at an hourly rate at an hourly rate. Mr. Peter Foster, QC, and the undersigned will bill at an hourly rate of $1,008.08. And $806 and $1,806.46, respectively. The hourly rate for other lawyers in the firm range from $403.23 all of these figures are in EC, to $712.37. So we, we received $51. We lost 30 acres of land. But here are the fees we are paying now for the lawyer to go and do what, Madam Speaker? We now hired a lawyer to try and get back the land that we gave. So here's the cabinet. They give the people 51 acres, they give them 51% of the 58 acres of land. And then they now hire a lawyer to go back and get the land to be returned to the NHC. And you know the lawyers lose the case. You know up to now, the land, Madam Speaker, now that's one set of lawyers. They have other lawyers' fees there, 136,000. All kinds of figures. Now, Madam Speaker, the member for Castries, he speaks about motive. You want to speak about motive with Ojo Labs? What was the motive for giving the land? Nobody didn't put a gun to your head and tell you give the land. You give it away, and then you go and hire a lawyer to claim it back. There's no motive there, Madam Speaker. Ask him what was the motive. That's why we need the artificial intelligence. You catch me? You catch me? <laughs> Madam Speaker, we don't have to bend any minds. The people can make up. You see, you continue to underestimate the people of St. Lucia, and you think that politicians can fool the people. But I know politicians can fool the people. When the people don't want us in the house again, they put us out. It's not because anybody fooled them. And they didn't want you again, and they put you out. So behave yourself. <laughs> Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, so... The member speaks about what was the motive. So I want to ask them, when one of them take their feet, because they couldn't speak the last time, so I guess this time they can speak. They have mustered some courage, now they can speak. When they come to speak, I want them to respond to how, what was the motive for giving this. Now, Madam Speaker, you think it ended there? After they refused to pay the man who did the work three million dollars for his work, he took the government to court. In 2015, they lost the case. Never made any arrangement to pay him. The court now put the property up for auction on the 25th of July. So 58 acres of land. The court awarded judgment to the tune of seven million dollars to the contractor. You want to talk about management? The member for Viewfort South and the rest of you who are in the cabinet. One, I tell you, if I do that, I report into Bodile. I don't need nobody to come and arrest me. Yes. 
If I ever manage this economy like this, if I ever manage the Ministry of Housing in the manner that this previous government managed it, I'm reporting myself. Yes, I'm always careful. So, Madam Speaker, now we have a lawsuit. We have to come up with $7 million to pay before the 25th of July or the land goes up for auction. Fortunately, Madam Speaker, we were able to intervene and put the upset price at seven, at about $7 million. So at least if it goes up for auction, we are covered. What law I broke? No, we had to appeal to the court to set the upset price. You understand anything you say in there? We cannot buy the court selling. We requested for your information. No, I thought you had understanding, but now I realize your most basic understanding is not there. Because I have said, Madam Speaker, it is a matter that is in the court. I have no say in this. All we could do is request that an upset price be put in place so that if the property, if the auction goes through, at least we are not losing the land and then still have money owing. Madam Speaker, that was the level of management. Now that's just one of them, Madam Speaker. Just one item I chose to highlight today. And at every sitting, I will highlight another one, just on the housing, to know the amount of chaos that happened under their watch, Madam Speaker. But today, they want to advise us. So, Madam Speaker, for 51 EC dollars is all we receive. And we have paid, it, has co it is now costing us 58 acres of land or $7 million. We have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to Labor Party lawyers. Their own lawyers. Now, you want to talk about motive? When I saw the number of stop notices that was issued, Madam Speaker, the number of things that came into question, I cannot understand how we lost the case. So I believe that one has motive. I believe there was motive for losing the case. Maybe the intention was that we should always lose the case, but some people should make money. I don't know, Madam Speaker, because when I weigh the evidence that I am seeing, and so, Madam Speaker, when we talk about the management of the economy, when we talk about what brought us to where we are, ask them, they did a whole development that we are, the land don't belong to us. They put roads, they put everything. They didn't know that the land, we do not have full title to the land. I now have to go back to cabinet and do an acquisition to try and regularize it. Madam Speaker, these members on the opposite side were playing politics, which is what they do best, and they never manage the affairs of this country. So today, Madam Speaker, when this honorable prime minister comes to this honorable house and seek the approval of the house to borrow money, St. Lucians can rest assured that this will be money well spent. This will be money that is used to grow this economy, to clean up the mess created by the previous administration. You want to know about rollover of debt? You think you don't know? You know, you know what you left there. You're not supposed to be a tax consultant. You don't know what, you don't know what mess you left the country in? Yes, I always paid my taxes. I never, get pardoned by, I never get pardoned by Bank of St. Lucia when I had overdraft, you know. I paid for it. Those who benefit from it, they know themselves, they're in this house. When they were owing, and they wrote it off for them. You think I don't know? I know. Everything I have, I work for it and I pay for it. No handovers. So I want, you, I want the members in this house to understand that the people of St. Lucia know the things that are happening, Madam Speaker. And we had some bad managers who left this country in a crisis situation, Madam Speaker. And that is why this budget has such a large deficit. 
I heard the, I'll close on this point, Madam Speaker. I heard the member for Viewfort North say, why would the Prime Minister come and say this when he knows he has to go on the bond market? This is honesty. This is integrity. This is transparency. We are not creating a false sense of where this economy is at, Madam Speaker. Did you mean Viewfort South, Honorable Member? Viewfort South. Sorry, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The member for Viewfort South. He wants to know why would the Prime Minister come? Because that is the reality. We don't want to make people believe everything is nice. Just come. But you know when you give people the truth, Madam Speaker, they know they can trust you. They know they can depend on the information. And they know that this is a government that is determined to turn around this economy and to make it work better. And that is why I stand 100% behind this resolution because I know that we have a team of persons who are going to utilize the resources for the benefit of the people of this country. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member for Viewfort North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I thank you for this opportunity. And I did not intend to speak on this resolution. And I, didn't, I really did not. I really felt that the leader of the opposition and other members, the ex-prime minister, did justice to the resolution or to the, to the motion. Madam Speaker, the question in the motion speaks to raising $103 million to finance the 2017-2018 budget. And I realize that this House, not just the Speaker, but this House gave latitude to the member for Castry Southeast to speak about NICE, Ojo Labs, Rochamel, River Dore, people taking government to court, level of management, acquisition of property, and so on. And I thought it necessary to make a few comments in response. And Madam Speaker, I heard him speak about a certain name not being in the house. It is to be recalled that this particular name is a minister. When I was minister for agriculture, I had no fear because I had a good record. I, I, could, I could have spoken in this house. This current minister for agriculture, whom they speak of, anytime I'm in the house, he's afraid to speak before me. That's the reality. That's the reality. I didn't run. <laughs> the last debate, I spoke. He's afraid to speak before me. He's the minister. So why is he afraid to speak before me? I'm supposed to be a little lapo fellow in my constituency. He's afraid to speak. So I am not afraid. My record is clear. My record in the Social and Economic Review I'm proud of. And you can read it and compare. All the figures are there. My record is there. So I'm very proud. But having said so, Mr. and Madam Speaker, I wish to say that <coughs> what happened a while ago with the member for Castry South is is the very thing I suspect when I read the newspapers and when I read Facebook and so on, is the very thing that St. Lucians generally and young people in particular are tired of. You know, we are speaking on a motion to borrow money to finance the budget. And this gentleman member for Caspi South is, he comes with Rocha Mel and he talks about you all did this and he all did that how many years ago, and he's pontificating. And this gentleman, Madam Speaker, believes that when he speaks rough and he, 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 he dances around the parliament, so he that, that. that he is he's speaking things that matter. But equally so, Madam Speaker, I don't want to go down that road. But just for balance, we can equally speak about, he speaks about management and mismanagement. He speaks about agencies taking the government to court. I can speak about agencies when I became minister that wrote to our government, threatening to take the government to court. I can speak about the marketing board 
and some of what we had to deal with, debts ranging from 2010. I can speak about what this Minister of Finance had to do to ensure that our assets overseas were secure because of, 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 of imports by the marketing board. And there are others. I can speak about $60 million or more for the Reed Skelton project. We, can we talk about those things also? I can also speak about over 300 acres of land. When you talk about Reed Skelton and the others, we can speak about the Black Bay development. We can speak about the Dyer Mall, 30 something million dollars. You see, this is what I'm talking about. So when he speaks about it, the Labour Party comes to speak about it, and this one comes to speak about it. The young people who want to get into politics saying, but what is wrong with those guys? We are here to talk about $130 million, and the member for Viewfort South asked some pertinent questions so that we can move forward. But the member goes and talks about all kinds of things, so I need to respond. What about management? What about the, the election of a deputy speaker? We had a deputy speaker. We had a deputy speaker in the House who was made a minister. What about, man, what about this? What about, Madam Speaker, when we speak about, he spoke about the nice workers and Ojo Labs. We have said over and over again, no power against employment by set -Lysien. We are not against it. All we are saying is, you cannot trust the word of this government. They said that you can't use borrowed money, you can't use money to finance the nice workers. After pressure upon pressure, they said the program should have ended, but they kept parts of it. You can't trust what they say. They said the program should have ended, but they turned around after pressure and they kept parts of it, released the people whom they thought were Labour Party supporters, and took in people whom they believe are United Workers Party supporters. You can't trust what they say. They also said, Madam Speaker, that you need to invest in skills. But the very St. Lucians that they released from the jobs in the NICE program, they turn back now and he's claiming that it is St. Lucians who will be getting the $1,000, speaking from two sides of their of, of the face. What are you really saying? Qui s'en gardia? So say Jean qui ne gâte pas by nice, yo pas cette lycéen. Avec ces gens qui gâte pas by Ojo Labs, c'est yo qui cette lycéen. What are what are what are you really saying? Are you saying that you can use taxpayers' money to fund Ojo Labs, but you can't use taxpayers' money to fund people who are taking care of the elderly? That you can't use taxpayers' money to fund people who are assisting principals in primary schools? Is that what you're saying? So since he opened all of this up, Madam Speaker, I wish to continue. What about, what about the so-called so deals for the, for the airport in the previous government? You want to bring documents to talk about things? What about tuxedo villas? You speak about Rochambeau. What's about the tuxedo villas issue that went to court? And the court determined that this now prime minister, then minister, that you really can't trust what he says. What about that? If you really want to start talking about open up old wounds. But again, is that what the young people want? Is that what they want? Is that what they really want? Because, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise on a point of elucidation. The, the Madam member, Speaker, the point member, of elucidation, I don't yield. Member, what about tuxedo villas? What about tuxedo villas? What about tuxedo villas? Point of elucidation, I do not yield, Madam Speaker. I do not wish to yield. Point of elucidation. Point of elucidation. Point of elucidation. Point of elucidation. What about tuxedo villas? So the point I'm making here, Madam Speaker, is this. If we are talking about $130 million, that we, that, that's what we're talking about. And I'm tired of hearing young people say, when those politicians come and accuse each other, why has none of them gone to jail? Why? Why are they coming to the house and pontificate and say, oh, Dr. Anthony did this, and here are the documents and so on? Let's get serious. You had an investigation into St. Jude's, and you said some people will take jail because they deserve to take jail. That is what the young people want to see. 
bring the report, send it to the DPP, and let people pay. Because we are tired of bringing a simple bill to this house, and this member for Castle South is, goes all down the donkey road about Roger Mel and this and that. If you're talking about Roger Mel, talk about Tuxedo Villas. Talk about what happened in Tuxedo Villas. Or Black Bellands. And then let the people of this country decide. Or Canals. And you talk about elections determine what happens. Of course. And we accept. Et nous d'accord, Madame Speaker, élection qui a décidé bagay. Et nous pas, nous pas peur qu'on nous perde élection, vous savez. We are not afraid. We accept the decision of the people. Just like you two have lost elections, some of you there. That's the reality of life. The member for Babuno who touts himself as the, the guru for agriculture, he lost in an agriculture seat. He lost in an agriculture seat. He lost his seat. He lost his seat. So we accept, we accept the results of elections. And that is what happens when the people believe that we have not done what we should have done, or when they believe what you tell them, when they believe your marketing. And so we accept. But having accepted this, don't come to the house and, and, and take a, a simple thing. Let's debate where is the money coming from, the, the, the key questions. It's 130, 103 million. Where are you getting the rest from? What are the interest rates? How does it benefit the country? And if you believe that we did something, we stole money or whatever, whatever, take it to the right place. It is time for politicians to stop this. It's time. All the documents you lay in the house of who sold land there and who did this and whatever, the people of St. Lucia, they are tired of it. When we were concerned about Tuxedo Villas, we took it to court, and we got a result. And the result indicated what it said. When we were concerned about the Taiwanese funds, and what you all did, whether you all, you, all, you all had Sufra and Band and all of that, whether you all went to View Fort North, and $500,000 can't be accounted for up to now, the people who are saying, I'm a so-called so parliamentarian, I'm a so-called rep, let them answer to that, and that ain't finished yet. When we were concerned about it, we caused an investigation to be had, and we sent it to the DPP. We took action. We took action. So, so you know, you come to the house and smiling, greeting from, from mouth to mouth. When we speak about CHTTI, you green from mouth to air, as if that's a puppy show. As if it's a puppy show. Madam Speaker, all I'm saying is this. There are key questions that need to be answered about the $103 million. The member for Castle South East raised issues of management. And if we are to raise issues of management, Madam Speaker, we can go into what has happened to so many people who have lost their jobs. So instead of continuing for a program of Black Cigar Talker, what do they do? They fire some of the key scientists and people who have been so successful, if you want to talk about management. And if you want to talk about management, we can talk about what's happening to the National Trust. And if you want to talk about management, we can talk about those contracts that have been signed by CDP contractors who have not gotten their monies. And if you want to talk about management, we can talk about what is happening to the artists and the cultural center. And I believe, Madam Speaker, it's a strategy for to, to blame moon. That's what's happening to this government. So when a serious matter comes, you got to blow. So the member for Cassius office jumps up, and he jumps on the member for, for, for Viewfort South. You know? He got to blame. He brings back Rochamel. To blame. The Prime Minister says one thing in one interview, he says the man will build a race track out of his own money. Next thing, the other interview, he comes back and says, oh, he's going to build it, but we're going to refund him from CIP. Too blay. So they, are, so they are mixing you up, Madam Speaker, with mixed messages and deliberate untruths. So the people of St. Lucia are not sure what's happening. They are not sure what's happening. So let us answer the key questions and stop talking about 
all of those things. And if you want to talk about them, if you do want to talk about them, and there's a debate about them, bring the documents. Bring documents, if that's what the debate is about. I'm not afraid of talking. If that is what the debate is about, bring the documents to the House and let the chips fall where they may. If a government is serious, if a government is serious about stopping this foolishness, you know what they will do? Appoint a special prosecutor. Put it in the hands of a special prosecutor. Let them investigate those things and let the chips fall where they may. All the St. Jude's thing you're talking about, let you realize, Madam Speaker, let the chips fall where they may. Make it public and let the chiefs fall where they may. That's all I have to say, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Madam Speaker. Honorable Member for Labra. <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to return to the central focus, or what should be the central focus of this debate, responding to a motion presented by the Prime Minister. During the course of the opposition's response, we call for sanity. We issued another call for sanity. We issued the call for sanity on the basis that one, high debt to GDP ratio narrows room for fiscal maneuver and for fiscal policy flexibility. Also, Madam Speaker, and I did quote from this document before in this Honorable House, and it is recorded in Hansard, and it's an IMF report, that currency unions with fixed exchange rates can induce mutually conflicting fiscal <coughs> incentives. On the one hand, fiscal overspending by one country can trigger a costly abandonment of the peg for the entire union, thereby requiring utmost fiscal discipline by union members. Conversely, under some conditions, member governments can defer the cost of fiscal slippages to the future or share them with other members, which induces moral hazard behavior. Fiscal policies in the Eastern Caribbean currency union countries have become more expansionary over time, and in comparison, with other Caribbean countries. Primary balances in the ECCU countries have been persistently deteriorating for more than a decade, reflecting rapid buildup <coughs> and growth of expenditure and sluggish revenues. And actual fiscal outcomes have progressively diverged from the fiscal guidelines established by the ECCB's Monetary Council in 1998." Unquote. Madam Speaker, we are pegged to the U.S. dollar, and as, as small islands in the Eastern Caribbean, we do have a responsibility to maintain fiscal discipline in our jurisdiction. In the period that I was in opposition, and it was on the April 28, 2009, whilst I was in opposition for the very first time, in warning this government about the possibility of that very same narrowing of room for fiscal maneuver. I did indicate, and I quote from Government Hansard, <coughs> April 28th, 2009, page 91. Madam Speaker, the weak fiscal position of the government can affect the change of expectations on the financial market since the current policies may lose their credibility. If the economy is in a state of flux and there is uncertainty in a country even right now, where we talk about bonds, 
it may affect it because it will make it difficult, if not impossible, if we continue to go down the road like we have been doing for the government to finance the debt by issuing bonds, unquote. In the aftermath of that address to this Honorable House, <clears throat> we had difficulty raising monies because of that same type of behavior, this same type of pamele behavior, that when the opposition speaks, take the time to research, come to this Honorable House and address themselves to the case in point, which is the motion before the House. We are always confronted with abuse from the opposite side. Madam Speaker, in response to the call for sanity, the member for Caswell Southeast, my good friend, the member for Caswell Southeast, decides to attempt to belittle the former Prime Minister and Minister for Finance. But what is his record? What is the former Prime Minister and Minister for Finance record? And I wish to quote from their own document, Fiscal and Structural Reforms in St. Lucia Towards a Comprehensive Agenda. And just the executive summary says, and speaking about the period that the member for Beaufort South and former Prime Minister managed, he said, the improvement in fiscal performance in the past four years, a clear acknowledgement that there was an improvement in the fiscal position of the country during the management of the former Prime Minister. But more importantly, Madam Speaker, the period 19, the period 1997 to 2006 is a very interesting period, a period that will set the record straight and that every school child and every individual in this country would be able to appreciate that what the member for Kasri Southeast has been saying are vulnerable to the facts. What are the facts, Madam Speaker? And I did in 2010 speak to the performance of the former Prime Minister in Government Hansard. And I quote, the Labour government under the leadership of Dr. Kenny D. Anthony utilized the budget as a strategic instrument of development and change that was serious, objective, and focus, and successfully move St. Lucia from recovery to expansion during the period 1997-2006. From recovery to expansion, how it all started. On November 7, 1997, six months after the May 23, 1997 general election, it became necessary for the new government to present a supplementary budget in which the new Prime Minister and Minister for Finance sought to rearrange the national priorities to suit the philosophical outlook of the Labour Party and to fulfill its promises as contained in its contract of faith. The theme of this first budgetary statement was to lay the foundations to stabilize the economy and redefine its priorities. And it was for a total of $124.9 million for a six-month period. Sustaining and stimulating growth. On April 21st, 1998, having succeeded in the initial task of stabilizing the economy and redefining the government's development priorities, Dr. Anthony presented his second budget address, 1998-1999, which was really the first to cover a complete financial year or fiscal year. Under the theme, stimulating and reorienting the economy towards sustained growth. That budget was for $633.9 million. The next, recov reform, recovery, modernization, and consolidation. Prime Minister's Anthony third to eighth budget addresses covered the following themes. Institutional reform, economic consolidation, and social recovery, 1999 to 2000, a total of 744 Point four million dollars. Strengthening, modernizing, and repositioning the economy, 2000 to 2001. Inspiring and sustaining development in a changing world, 
2001-2002, million. Enhancing investment, revitalizing agriculture, and stimulating recovery, 2002 to 2003, $780.8 million. Advancing infrastructural development and economic recovery in an uncertain world, 2003 to 2004, $863.3 million. Strengthening, modernizing, and repositioning the economy, 2004 to 2005, $768.5 million. Consolidating gains, developing a world-class destination, and enhancing human resource capacity, 2005 to 2006, $954.1 million. During that period, the people philosophy was apparent. The socioeconomic logic was sound, and the programs were practical and realistic. Despite global challenges like new international trade rules, and the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks on the United States of America, from as early as six months after September 11, Prime Minister Kenny Anthony was able to report the very first signs of economic recovery, a modest growth rate of 0.5% for 2001. A year later, the economy was responding positively to the government's policies and rebounded well with a 3.1% growth rate. Investors were expressing more confidence. The tourism and manufacturing sectors were picking up. There was increased activity within the agricultural sector and infrastructural products and projects were proceeding at a rapid pace. This was followed in 2003 with a growth rate of 4%. As the signs of economic recovery became even more evident and infrastructural developments in the country increased. The tourism sector had by then replaced the agricultural sector as the lead economic sector. Investor confidence was high with more local and foreign investments coming on stream. Over $1 billion worth of investments had been committed to the tourism sector alone. St. Lucia had become a world-class destination and all sectors of the economy were reporting progress including the agricultural sector, which was adversely affected by climate change and a more active hurricane season. Regional and international financial institutions also praised the Kenny Anthony government for its management of the best performing economy among the independent nations of the OECS. From recovery to expansion. Dr. Anthony's 2006-2007 budget of April 25, 2006 was his last before the 2006 general elections, but it was probably his best. A record growth rate of 5.4% was reported, and St. Lucia was again commended by international financial institutions for its management of the economy generally and for controlling the island's debt. The $1.1 billion budget, which had as its theme from recovery to expansion, was welcomed by all and reported progress in all sectors except agriculture and proposed no additional taxes. It also projected a growth rate of 6.6% for that year and aimed to continue consolidating the gains of the past eight years while seeking to ensure that the state's finances supported sufficiently St. Lucia and the region's hosting of Cricket World Cup 2007 without negatively affecting other sectors. Madam Speaker, among the priorities of the Kenny Anthony administration were job creation, poverty alleviation, reduction of inequality, and the overall growth of the country's wealth, and it delivered on all those areas. After its first year in office, unemployment was already down to 16%, confirmed by the IMF. But what was the report card at the end of 2006? What we left for the United Workers' Party government? The economy had grown by over 5.4%. Unemployment was down to 13.6%. Wealth was more evenly distributed in this country. And indigence had been reduced significantly. Is that the failed policies of the St. Lucia Labour Party? Is that what you call a failed record? 
and I challenge the United Workers Party administration to present any corresponding position and match it with that particular record. You see, Madam Speaker, we must understand that in this honorable house, we are here to make our contribution. And maybe in future UWP cabinets, when the name Honorable Guy Joseph emerges, they might even say, who's that individual? A future cabinet of either party, they may not recognize us, looking for trouble and try to butcher people in this house and attack them unnecessarily. We are on different sides. But don't try to take away what's due to the member for Beaufort South. He was a, an excellent prime minister, but he's not God. He's not perfect. What we are here to do is to ensure that we study the shortcomings of the previous administration and try to build upon solid foundations. That's what we are here to do. Not try to erase the record of an individual who grapple with the objective reality of a serious, small, and vulnerable economy. But no, fail policies. And what are the policies that you have that are superior to the policies that he embraced? You try to lambase him in, 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 the, in the appropriation bill by indicating that in terms of tourism, that you all had a new approach, unlike the Labour Party, and mention hotels that were the offsprings of a Labour Party government, headed by the member for Beaufort South. Headed by the member for Beaufort South. And we diversified into a number of different companies so that we do not put all our eggs in one basket. Because when you have one individual dominating, and both husband and wife works for the very same company, and you probably approach the bank for a loan, they assess the risk of people being employed in the same company. When we diversify, we are diversifying the risk. That is the type of thinking that was embraced by the former prime minister. You talk about Rochamel. Rochamel. Up to now, nobody has presented a document and read from it and say, these were the sections that were inimical to the well-being of the people of this country. But we have picked up the DSH agreement. The DSH agreement. And we are reading the clauses in this agreement and showing clearly why it's inimical to the well-being of the people of this country. But I challenge them to come with the Rochamel agreement and tell the people of St. Lucia what exactly they are talking about. Everybody confused. What are they talking about? You, we need to stop this nonsense. We need to be mature in this honorable house. You want to debate policy? Let's debate policy. But you all are unable to debate, so you all change the subject by attacking people unnecessarily. Let us engage in more mature discussions in this honorable house. And I will continue, Madam Speaker, to address myself very seriously to the issues that tantalize our country. I am not going to be sidetracked by anybody else. When I stand up to make my contribution, I make a contribution that is befitting the moment. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to support this uh, resolution brought to the Minister by the Minister of Finance to borrow various sums of money to uh, finance the budget, Madam Speaker, in the sum of $103 million dollars and a sum of 262 million madam speaker for the refinancing of existing debts on the regional government securities market or through private placements at a maximum rate of 7.5 percent madam speaker i i thought that we were going to come here and go through a very straight what is a very straightforward and normal procedure in the parliament but then, you know, Madam Speaker, um, people who should know better came in and tried to create all kinds of confusion as though the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance was doing something that was so unusual and so abnormal. 
Madam Speaker, I listened to the Honorable Member for Castries East, and he said that the deficit which uh, we now have in this budget was one of the largest we are presiding over in a long time. And Madam Speaker, it has already been made a document of the House that the current deficit is 220 million. But I want to quote for him on page 80 of the Minister of Finance, uh, former Minister of Finance, page 18 of the 2015, page 80, sorry, of the 2015 budget statement by the then Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, which indicated that the deficit then, not so long ago, Madam Speaker, was more than the deficit which we have projected in the current estimates. Madam Speaker, it suggested that the deficit, and by his own admission, I want to read his own word, he said that the deficit projected is 227 million Eastern Caribbean dollars, Madam Speaker, which not so long ago was $7 million more than the deficit which we currently had. So, Madam Speaker, I just want to correct the honorable member and to admonish him that we ought to be responsible and take the time to do our research to make sure that we do not mislead the public as it pertains to the uh, information, uh, Madam Speaker, in this debate. So that is the first point that I want to make, Madam Speaker. Um, the other point I want to make, Madam Speaker, is the incoherence with which the two speakers, I mean, the, we saw the uh, member for Castries East speaking first, and then um, he said, that uh, the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance should explain where is he going to borrow the money from and suggested that the sums suggested here were insufficient to finance uh, the budget. And then, just minutes later, the, his own former Minister of Finance explained to him in his speech that um, as a Minister of Finance, he understands uh, the, uh, the need for a Minister of Finance to come and finance his budget. And, and such practices, he said in his own words, has actually happened before. So I, I'm just wondering, Madam Speaker, whether the attempt here is to find a political message and, and, we, and, and as a result we see the desperation, or whether the attempt is a serious attempt at adding to a serious debate uh, to contribute to this country. Madam Speaker, we heard that um, we see that uh, the member for Viewfort South suggested that it was an unusually crafted resolution in his own words and said so. And, you know, I thought to myself that when it comes to the operation of finances, that we ought to be more concerned about substantial matters as it, as it pertains to the behavior of government ministers uh, and how they deal with public finances, not whether a resolution is crafted well, that is semantics, right? But what is more important? Uh, what is the level of governance? What is the level of, of diligence? And what is the level of commitment that we will place on the structures and the behaviors of government ministers who, when they're in office, that will not, Madam Speaker, in any way unduly influence or use their position to influence boards, so that we can have descriptions of accounts as ministers' account, that's a violation of good governance. And you know what I found amusing is that we're going to nitpick those little issues, but fail to deal with the fundamental challenges which we face in the governance of our country. And so now, you know, the the uh, the resolution was unusually crafted. That's 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 semantics. Let's deal with the bigger issues, right? Let's ensure, let's make a, a, a rule, a principle among ourselves to say that whether it is on this side or this side, none of us should have a minister's account or there should be no account in the name of any minister resembling such, Madam Speaker. Those are the financial structures and the financial principles by which we must, Madam Speaker, adhere to with diligence and commitment, Madam Speaker, so that we can avoid the situation that we have found ourselves in. The Honorable Member for Viewfort South know fully well that what we have inherited, Madam Speaker, is a very difficult situation. 
when we took over the debt stock, it was nearing $3 billion. He said in his own uh, budget speech of 2015 that the market, Madam Speaker, wasn't amenable to borrowing, uh, to lending uh, St. Lucia because of our high debt levels, that we had become high risk to investors. And therefore, they were not, Madam Speaker, amenable to lending us uh, long-term loans. It was said by him, not me, in his own budget statement of 2015. It is there, it has been made a document of the House. And now you're gonna come, honorable member, to ask the question, why is St. Lucia attracting such a high rates of interest? This was there in your time. What we are trying to do is to correct that situation. And Madam Speaker, which is why when we came in, our government took the policy position, Madam Speaker, that what we will try to do is to shift away from the short-term bonds and replace them with longer standing bonds, Madam Speaker, and lending arrangements so that what we would have done in effect, Madam Speaker, is reduce the interest rates by which uh, the loans cost. And so it's there. It's in your own words. I am not making up lies. This is not about politics as usual. We have to come to this honorable house and be consistent. Let us not prove bingo right. Let us not let that calypso that was written many years ago, let, let, us, let, let us prove that wrong. And let us show the country that we have moved on. And, and so when we say one thing in opposition, we mean another thing, right? And that is where we have to go. Let us be consistent. You can't be now trying to put pressure or uh, coming up with all of these statements and all of these principles, you know, lecturing the House. When in your time you admitted, uh, Honorable Member for Viewfort South, through you, Madam Speaker, indicated that the market wasn't amenable. St. Lucia had become high risk, Madam Speaker. And so, Madam Speaker, the, the, it must also be noted, Madam Speaker, that while the resolution clearly states, clearly states, clearly states, Madam Speaker, that the rate of interest, Madam Speaker, would be at a maximum of 7.5%. It did not say that it will be 7.5%, as some of the speakers may have tried to suggest here, Madam Speaker. And so, Madam Speaker, I want to give my fullest support, and I want to tell my friends that this government continues to be transparent. This government continues to ensure that there's frank and full disclosure. Um, and I was surprised to to hear, you know, people ask about, you know, the Prime Minister to, to disclose, frankly, uh, how he's going to finance the rest of the budget. I mean, frank and full disclosure. I don't think any one of you are entitled to speak about frank and full disclosure. Honorable Member, your silence on Jafali is deafening, deafening. And you want to talk about frank and full disclosure? The, the House is still waiting. For, for, for there to be an explanation as to whether Grindberg, as to whether you knew that Grenada was already in existing problems when you made the decision to sign off thousands of acres of the island seabed to a man whom we don't know, right? So we're not entitled to talk about frank and full disclosure. I am happy to talk about anything you want to talk about. Anything you want to talk about, right? But let release your silence, release your silence, break your silence on Jafali, and then you can talk. But you cannot, you cannot, no, that court procedure is just semantics. That's what you guys do. You, you come and you issue a libel suit to try and threaten people to silence them on issues and get them afraid. That's, that's semantics, right? But when you want to talk about frank and full disclosure, okay, when you want to be transparent, when you want to be accountable and transparent, let us talk about what and, and what led you to condone a minister in your government that, that had a, a, an account in his name that said, this is the minister's account. I mean, come on. Madam Speaker, on a point of order. Yes. 
misleading the house. The honourable member is misleading the house by suggesting that there was an account in my name, a matter that we've addressed before in this honourable chamber, and I'm asking that the statement be withdrawn. Madam Speaker, there's nothing to withdraw because I have made it absolutely clear that the. Honorable Mem, Honorable Minister with Responsibility for Tourism. The Honorable Member for Denry North is correct in saying that there has been, whilst there have been an account called the Minister's Account, let us not mistaken that or read into that that this account was in the Minister's name. That is something completely different. And that point and that point is misleading. And so I am, I am ruling that this statement be withdrawn, not an account in the name of the minister. It says an account called a minister's account. That is something entirely different. So let us not suggest that the account was in the name of the minister. Can we, can you appreciate this, the difference? <coughs> Madam Speaker, the, the, the larger point here is that while the minister was in office, there was a, an account as it pertains to his ministry that was described as the minister's account. Correct. Correct. Described as the minister's account. But let us not make statements that there, there, are, there is an account in the minister's name. That is something completely different. Madam Speaker, that is the point being established consistently all throughout in that we're in, um, indicating that while the minister was in office, there was an account uh, in his ministry over which he had charge for described as the minister's account. Honorable minister, please have a seat. Let us clear the air, please. Statements are being made that there is an account in the minister's name. That is quite different to a statement saying that there was a, an account called a minister's account. The name of the account was a minister's account. It was not an account in the name of a minister. The name of a minister is Dominic Fady. That is the name of a minister. Within your ministry, to have a minister, uh, an account called the minister's account is quite different to an, to an account being called an account in the name of the minister. That is what I'm trying to establish, and that, that is what I do not want um, there to be any um, misunderstanding or misinterpretation of. And your statement suggested or alluded to the fact that the account may have been in the name of the personal name of the minister. That is what I want clarified and saying that in itself is wrong. Madam Speaker, well, uh, please allow me to clarify. Um, what I am indicating and what I'm suggesting is that while the minister uh, was in office, Madam Speaker, uh, the ministry under his care, the department which uh, I'm going to make reference to is the National Lotteries. And while that minister, uh, who happens to be the honorable member for Denry South, um, was in office and held the ministry, Denry North, sorry, uh, held the Ministry of Sports uh, portfolio in a department which falls directly under his ministry, Madam Speaker, uh, there was described, an account was described as the minister's account. So that is, I hope that we're now on the same page. Yeah, but that is what I'm suggesting. So I'm not saying that there was a, 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 I have never said, Madam Speaker, that there is an account in the name of Honorable Sean Edwards. But clearly, there was an account, and let me clarify, and I'll say it again, while the Honorable Member for Denry North 
uh, was the Minister of Sport. There was an account described as the Minister's account, uh, which he admitted, Madam Speaker, that he had, uh, he was allowed to facilitate certain projects. And th these are his own words. Okay? So it might not have been called Sean Edwards, but it was the Minister's account, described as the Minister's account. Are we now clear? Yes. Okay, so this is the point I'm trying to establish in, in going forward in that, uh, in my mind, Madam Speaker, this is a gross violation of good governance. And what we ought to be worried about is not how a resolution is crafted, but we ought to be worried about, uh, mostly about the structures of, of governance. And we have to ensure that the financial operation, Madam Speaker, that when ministers are given a responsibility to preside over large amounts of monies, that there ought to be no account that is described as a minister's account. And that is the point that is being established here, Madam Speaker. So I want to make it absolutely clear, and I want to make sure that we are on the same page and there's coherence in, uh, in your understanding and mine. Uh, so, so therefore, Madam Speaker, I'm going to reiterate the point that whether on this side or that side, it should never be allowed for there to be an account in any minister's name, Madam Speaker, no, sorry, described as a minister's account, Madam Speaker, while you are presiding over the portfolio. That, that, is, that is the point being established. And so, Madam Speaker, um, we have to make sure that we adhere to prudent financial management. And you know what was disappointing in this whole thing? What was disappointing is that the honorable member for Denry North stood next to a former minister of finance, who then patted him on the back to say to him that you should challenge that. And when it was raised by the honorable member for Denry South that there was uh, a description of an account named uh, it, uh, the minister's account. That he was encouraged, Madam Speaker, by a former Minister of Finance to challenge the statement. And now we are splitting hairs about how a resolution is crafted. Madam Speaker, this to my mind is semantics and this to my mind is a smaller issue. The bigger issue there, Madam Speaker, is that there should never be any account described as a minister's account. And Madam Speaker, if any one of my colleagues would ever do that, I will publicly criticize them to say that that is wrong. There should not be, Madam Speaker, when we are charged with the responsibility of managing uh, portfolios. And uh, for example, the national lotteries, there's a lot of money, Madam Speaker, that goes through an institution like that. And Madam Speaker, I want to make sure that this point is made clear. And it is absolutely pure that none of us, Madam Speaker, this side, that side, should be allowed to have uh, an account described as the minister's account. So this is the point. This is the point. And I want to I make sure that that is so. But it was sad to see that there, was, there seems to be a condoning of this practice when the honorable member for Denry uh, North received a pat in the back from his former minister of finance who asked him that he should challenge it, that he should challenge the member for him, him, imputing improper motives. I sat here and I watched it. And Madam Speaker, it was one of the most disappointing days that I have seen in this house. And so when I say this to establish a larger point, that if you have sat an exam, <coughs> and you have failed. You are therefore not entitled to lecture people on finances. The debt of this country rose to unprecedented levels under your stewardship. And it's there. And there's a former Minister of Finance who's here in the gallery who can tell you that uh, when the Labour Party took over this country, and the records will show, in 1997, the debt-to-GDP ratio was just over uh, 40%. Madam Speaker, by the end of their nine and a half years, it rose by 50% the debt. 
Madam Speaker, was nearing 60%, growing at a rate over uh, uh, of nearly 50%. And you can check the facts, it's there. And now you're coming to lecture people about finances. I find that to be duplicitous. I find that to be double standards. And I find that, Madam Speaker, to be out of order. So, Madam Speaker, I support uh, this resolution by the Minister of Finance. And I want to ensure the people of St. Lucia that this government is ready to get to work to finance its various programs and its various projects so that we can see uh, this economy uh, turned around. Thank you. Honorable Member for Denry North. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, after perusing the order paper this morning, I had already made a decision not to speak on the motion that is currently before us. And I reserved my energies to speak on a motion <coughs> that more directly impacts the constituency of Denry North. But given what has been said prior to me turning on my microphone, Madam Speaker, I feel obligated, not just from a personal standpoint, but on behalf of the people of Denry North, to add my voice to the debate. Madam Speaker, we've been getting mixed signals ever since this sitting was convened. It was the member for Ancillary Canaries who cited the word incoherence. It is obvious that there was no speaking plan on the government side. You listen to the member for Castries Southeast. And again, Madam Speaker, his affinity for history came to the fore. Instead of speaking on the immediate realities that confront our country, Madam Speaker, his preoccupation was centered around Rochamel, <coughs> Greinberg, and things per se. The member for ancillary canneries, Madam Speaker, who of late has become very amusing. And the only thing you can glean out of the presentations that he has made in this honorable house ever since becoming the parliamentary representative for ancillary, Madam Speaker, is that he amuses and he is fast becoming a subject of laughter, amusement, and somebody you have to question whether you should take seriously or not. Madam Speaker, he cited the minister's account in trying to provide justification for the resolution that is, that is before us. And he did that with one intention, as has been the collective intention of the United Workers' Party. And that is to defame me, to derail my character, Madam Speaker, and to sully my name and my reputation. Madam Speaker, he gave the impression that there is an account belonging to the National Office Authority in my name. A matter, I must say, Madam Speaker, does not, that does not resonate in the public domain. St. Lucians are a lot more discerning today than they were five years ago, than they were 10 years ago. So that any attempt to play cheap politics and to try and derail my political efforts by trying to smear my name will not find favor with the electorate and the persons whom you're trying to, to impress. In his contribution to the debate on the appropriation bill, Madam Speaker, the member for Castries Southeast, the political hitman that he is for his organization, sought to represent the interest of an entity or an organization which resides in the domain of three ministers in the cluster. Three ministers, Madam Speaker. But it was the member for Castries Southeast who was given, who was given the, 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 the mandate, the objective, and the task. Honorable Member for Denry North, may I, I recognize the mic of the Honorable Member for <coughs> Castry South East. <coughs> and Honorable Member, can you be so quick as to indicate? Madam Speaker, I'm standing stand? on a point um, of elucidation. I'm trying to understand political hitman. 
I, I am trying Madam to Speaker, understand. Madam Speaker, I notice the member has cited a point of elucidation and not a point of order, and so I am not inclined to yield to him. Point taken, um, Honourable he made his, When he made his remarks North. at the time, Madam Speaker, an hour was not sufficient time to do the task that was given to him. He requested additional time. So I would be appreciated very much if the member allows me to respond um, appropriately. Madam Speaker, he said a lot Madam of things Speaker, in his presentation. Madam Speaker, I would like point to... Point of order. I'd like to make reference to uh, Section 35.4 to cite that offensive language is being used by the member who is now making his presentation when he refers to another member of the House as a political leader. Honorable <coughs> Member for <coughs> Denry North. <coughs> Order, please. Order. The Honorable Member for Denry North cited the Honorable Member for Castries Southeast as a political hitman for his organization. Those were his exact words. And it is offensive language. And you should withdraw, sir. Madam Speaker, I withdraw the comment. Much obliged. But ma Madam Speaker, the member during his presentation was in a position, Madam Speaker, where he was able to present manipulated figures, lies, on truths, Madam Speaker, with one objective in mind, and that it was to damage my reputation. And what was baffling about it, Madam Speaker? The member was speaking on behalf of an agency which resides in a cluster where you have three ministers presiding over that cluster. He came and he cited Ida Inc., a company which the member, well, the Senator Joachim Henry has shares in, Madam Speaker. And because the National Lottery's Authority engaged Ida Inc. in a professional services contract, he attempted to give the impression that the National Lottery's Authority, and indirectly myself as minister, had engaged in untold corruption. And that what we had done was so offensive. But you know what is most interesting about that, Madam Speaker? The member was making the pronouncement at a time when he was being accused nationally on radio and on television of having paid or offered bribes to former cabinet colleagues on a particular contract which he was trying to secure either for himself or persons close to him. Madam Speaker, I will say like the member for Castries South, until <coughs> such time, the member for Castries Southeast can come publicly and deny that he attempted to bribe a former cabinet colleague. Until such time he can come and deny that he attempted to bribe his own prime minister at the time. Madam Speaker, I will not waste time and respond to anything else he has said. He came, either ink, and he was waving documents. Where did he get the documents from? Nobody knows. They had done an investigation into the National Lodges Authority. That ought to have been the easiest of any investigation carried out by this government. You know why? Because when I assumed ministerial responsibility for the National Lottery Authority, Madam Speaker, I was instructed by some very close associates of mine. They advised that the staff at the National Lottery Authority office should be sent home. But you know what, Madam Speaker? My response was very straightforward. The staff at the National Lodges Authority Office had done nothing to me. We were talking about individuals who had bills to pay. We were talking about people, Madam Speaker, who had commitments to the banks. And I insisted that as long as I was going to be the minister responsible for youth development and sports, the staff at the National Lodges Authority, whom I inherited from my predecessor minister, member for Grosily, they were going to keep their jobs. So that when you want to investigate today, you should get the full cooperation of the same persons whom you employed prior to me becoming minister. And I did not leave with any files. 
of folders, the information is there. So that when he, Madam Speaker, cited that there were hundreds of checks, of course there were hundreds of checks, and I am not going to be apologetic for any money spent by the National Logistics Authority. And it's a member from Vifort, Vifort Nov who said it. Investigate, probe. When you get your findings, take them to the right channels and hold me before the courts. Today, as we speak, Madam Speaker, the playing fields of St. Lucia are abandoned again. And young people have to patch up with money to buy a gallon of fuel at a gas station so that they can cut a little area on the playing field so they can break a sweat on an afternoon. That is happening today under your watch. And instead of you coming here and engaging constructive discussion about the future of our country, you've wasted a whole year. And you come and you try to attack people's character. You try to throw people under the bus. And he also gave the impression, Madam Speaker, that one minister had 20 million or 15 million under his watch and that no permanent secretary or nobody was involved. Madam Speaker, let me read an example of a letter to you. Mr. Michael St. Catherine, Chairman, National Lodges Authority. Dear Mr. St. Catherine, grateful for processing the payment for C.O. Williams Construction St. Lucia Limited. Please find attached invoice. C.O. Williams Construction Limited, $208,973.40. Your kind, usual cooperation is anticipated. Yours sincerely, Fortuna Belarus Permanent Secretary. And I can produce scores of letters like this. Where, Madam Speaker, it cannot be said, it cannot be said, Madam Speaker, that I acted unilaterally. I never did, Madam Speaker. And at no point, and it is he, the member for Castries South East, who said that nobody puts a gun to anybody's head. And that if the chairman of the National Lodges Authority was not satisfied with what monies had to be expended on, Madam Speaker, he had a right, as had happened before, to reject whatever came before the board. I can only provide direction. I was never involved in the operations of the National Logistics Authority. But the dishonest thing about it, Madam Speaker, when was the minister's account set up? And what was the purpose yes, of that yes, account being set up? Yes, and that is very that easy is, to verify. All you have to do is to go to the commercial banks. And in the case of lotteries, two of them. Who the Scotia Bank and the Bank of St. Lucia. And it was set up during the reign of the member for Grace Delay. And Madam Speaker, why was the account set up? The United Madam Workers Speaker, Party. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, on a point of order, the, the, the member is misleading the House here by suggesting that I set up any account. Yeah. Oh, Under no, no circumstances. No, 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 okay. There was there was no minister's order. account set up during my reign. Order. No account referred to as the minister's account. The minister no order. No account known as the minister of minister's account was set up during my reign. Madam Speaker, this is very easy to verify. You go into the banks where the lottery's monies have been banked, and you look at the opening dates of the accounts. And I want you to come in this honorable house and show me one account that was set up at any bank when I was the Minister for Youth Development and Sports. Yes. And I will tell you how to set up the account. And you know what is most disconcerting? Yes, yes, yes. My mic is on. Honorable member for Denry North, you have, in your words, indicated that the account called the minister's account, of which there has been much debate on, was not set up, or you are indicating that it was not set up during your tenure as the minister with responsibility for sports, and therefore the national lottery. And you have also indicated and stated that it was set up during the tenure, and that would, I would believe, during the period 2006 to 2011, somewhere during that time, during the tenure of the 
the member of the current member for Grosely having held that portfolio, which is the portfolio held you held, because he previously held it. Since you have indicated you have indicated that. The Honorable Member for Grosely has stood up on a point of order to say that it was not done during his tenure, Minister. You might as well, can I ask that you indicate to the Honorable House when was that account set up? Because you have indicated that it was not set up during your tenure and you came and found it. You found it. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker. I would like some order in this house, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Madam Speaker, <clears throat> the account was set up when the government of the United Workers' Party, was in office. by his own admission, was inundated with requests from young people, Madam Speaker, to attend university and to further their education. The amount allocated in the Ministry of the Public Service was grossly insufficient, which prompted the minister who had responsibility for the two ministries, separate ministries, the Ministry of the Public Service and Human Resource Development, and he was also the Minister for Social Transformation, Youth and Sports. And Madam Speaker, here's the letter that was sent to the Chairman of the Lotteries Board. Now, I can understand if you're taking monies from lotteries to fund a program that is aligned with the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports, then yes, that is okay. But the National Lotteries Authority money, and to the best of my recollection, close to $2 million, Madam Speaker, was being asked to trans the Chairman was being asked to transfer that money from the lotteries to finance the programs of the Ministry of the Public Service. And I will read the letter, Madam Speaker. Madam, Madam Ma Speaker, on a point of order. 35-5, the member for Denry North is imputing improper motive and is misleading the House. I, as <coughs> Minister of the Public Service, at no time asked the National Lotteries Board to uh, allocate any finances for the purpose of awarding scholarships. Neither have I at any time indicated that we had a problem meeting scholarships and that I asked the Board at the time to give scholarships to any young person. I've never said so. I've never done so. And I want the member for Denry North, if he cannot produce evidence to substantiate what he just said, to withdraw the statement that he just made. Bring the Honorable member for Denry North, you have been citing document and waving a letter or a document in your hand. The Honorable Member for, the Honorable Minister and Member for Grosley has asked, to which I will concur, that you make that document and proof of your allegation, make it a document of the House and show proof. And I ask that it be done now. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, permit me to read this letter into the record. Let's just not and, read, can we? Can we make copies? Yes, Madam yes, Speaker, we, we will make it the document of the House. And start at the date. Mr. November 2nd, 2011. When was the election? November 2nd, 2011. Letterhead. Ministry of the Public Service and Human Resource Development. Communication on this subject should be addressed to the Honorable Minister. Graham Louisi Administrative Building, Second Floor Waterfront, Castries, St. Lucia, West Indies. November 2nd, 2011. Mr. Allison Maffre, Chairman, St. Lucia National Lotteries Authority, Colony House, John Compton Highway, Castries. Dear Mr. Maffre, re request for financial assistance. Coming from the Ministry of the Public Service. Huh? The government of St. Lucia has received numerous requests for financial assistance from young persons seeking to further their education at local, regional, and international learning institutions. To date, we have assisted a significant number of students, but due to financial constraints, there are still persons whom we were unable to assist. In light of the above, I am seeking assistance from the National Lotteries Authority towards the education costs, plural, of students on the attached list. Thanking you in anticipation 
of your usual cooperation. Yours sincerely, Honorable Leonard Montut, Minister. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, this was the basis for the account being set up, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, again, I rise on a point of order. And Madam Speaker, I will clarify this matter because the Honorable Member is misleading the House. I want to indicate that the account being referred to on, by several members in this Honorable House as the Minister's account, with, in fact, the account that was referred to by the board appointed by the member for Denry North as the Minister's account, the, the same account that he referred to that he had jurisdiction over and was able on occasions to disburse funds to members without going to the board, that account was in fact set up way back somewhere around 2009, 2010, because at the time, the a national lottery, but not as a... Could you allow me to make my presentation in silence, please? Hold your, hold your horses. Because at the time, the national lottery was responsible for sponsoring the Windward Island schools team to the Windward Island games. In that year, in that year, they were not able to meet the cost, the finances, to sponsor the team. And as a result, a member of the board who represented the Ministry of Sports, Mr. Victor Reed, made the recommendation as a board member that they should set up a separate account to which $5,000 would be deposited for the purpose of securing the funding that is required to sponsor the Winwood Island team. Not for a minister, as a minister's account, not for a minister to have jurisdiction over, but for the purpose of sponsoring the Windward Island team. Subsequently, Madam Speaker... Can we stop the knocking while I get my head to understanding and listening to what the Honorable, member, the Honorable Member's Speaker, explanation, please? Thank you. Sorry. Subsequently, during the tenure of the member for Denry North, he wrote to the board asking that a certain quota of the, the, the proceeds of the National Lottery be put into that account so that he could have jurisdiction over that money and decide how it would be spent. That is when it became and was referred to as the Minister's Account. I'm trying to get my head around it. That's the honest truth. If I may, honorable <coughs> member, minister for equity, and member for Grosley. At the time the account was set up sometime in 2009, you indicated. What was the account called? 2009. Madam Speaker, it was an account opened by the National Lotteries Board for the purpose of uh, of putting an allocation which of $5,000 monthly toward raising the money required to sponsor the Windward Island Schools team annually. And you are saying the sole purpose of this account was to do was that? Was to do that. Subsequently, it was transformed to what is referred to as the minister's account on the strength of a letter written by the member for Denry North who asked that a third of the proceeds of the National Lottery be deposited in that account and that he would have jurisdiction and dictate how that money is spent.
Honourable Member for Denry North. Um, Honourable Member for Denry North, the, you, you read the letter dated 2nd of November 2011. Yeah. Um, just for, just for um, disclosure as well, I'm sure you have, you had side or wind of sight or wind of the attached list. Do you have it? I don't have it with me today, Madam Speaker. <laughs> okay, can you, can we ask that the document, Sarge? Can you take this letter and get 20 copies, please? Yeah. <coughs> Arthur down at the Proceed, Honorable Member for Denry North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's amazing how convenient the word semantics can be used to justify the position of some people, Madam Speaker. But all of a sudden, it is no more semantics. But I'm very happy that the member for Grozili was able to tell the Honorable House that the account was established in 2009. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, <coughs> Madam Speaker, the member for Castri Southeast during his presentation, he cited that, or he gave the impression that I had unilateral um, control over the disbursement of National Lottery's authority. Thanks. Madam Speaker, when the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports, Madam Speaker, when the... Thank you, Madam Speaker. When the Permanent Secretary at the time in the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports, Madam Speaker, can write scores of letters seeking amounts ranging from as low as $2,000 to more than a quarter million dollars, Madam Speaker, to the National Lottery's authority asking for payments to be expedited. And you must understand the context in which that was happening. But I will never stoop to a level and make it seem that anybody had any ulterior motive as it relates to the expenditure of the National Lottery's authority. Madam Speaker, I've said before and I'm going to say it again, and I will be very consistent. The Ministry of Youth Development and Sports suffered a massive budget cut. But luckily for us, we had that extra source called the National Lottery's Authority. So that when I sat with my PS, who happens to be a member of your cabinet, she knew exactly how much we had to play with to finance the capital projects in the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports. And that she could have picked up her pen, Madam Speaker, and write to the chairman of lotteries. But the thing about the National Lotteries Authority Act is that it does not recognize the permanent secretary. And projects can only be approved by either the board or the minister. So that when the PS, Madam Speaker, so that when the PS, Madam Speaker, comes with the paving of the court at the VG Sports Complex, Madam Speaker, she can sit down with CEO Williams, agree to an amount, and then she brings the documentation onto my desk for approval because the act gives me the authority. It's either the board, and the PS will not go and sit at the board meeting to get this approved because the work of the ministry has to go on. And there are scores of letters, Madam Speaker, that can be produced to substantiate what I am saying. Madam Speaker, on social media, in this chamber, Attack, 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 to go at my credibility. <laughs> to go, you've wasted an entire year. You've busted your travel budget. You've not been able to secure any investment. In your list of accomplishments after one year in office, very glaringly on your list, your slate, portholing of the Millennium Highway. But you think your energy is the best spent to come and attack my credibility and make it seem as if I, and you know what is shameful about it, Madam Speaker? There's one person who is the lead vocalist, and he's able to drag people along with him. And even the Prime Minister buys into that. And in his rebuttal on the debate on the estimates, Madam Speaker, make it in reference to National Lodge's authority to suggest that I did something. The member for View Fortinoff has said it. If I did something wrong at the national, as Minister for National Lodge's authority, I'm prepared to suffer the consequences. And I will go further to say, Madam Speaker, that when he came, and I, I, I must admit I was not prepared for this presentation, 
He spoke at length about the Marigo Plain facility. I authorized or sanctioned the project at Marigo, where a changing room was built for the young people in the Roseau Valley, Madam Speaker, to be able to recreate, get toilet facilities, and to raise the profile of the sports programs in that community. I was vilified for doing that. But this Prime Minister, and if you go to Marigot, you will find that there's a changing room. You spent $800,000 on a tent. Where is your tent? But if you leave here today, there's a changing room down in Marigot. That is what lottery's money was used for. And you have to go, Madam Speaker, for you, go and check the projects of the national lotteries across the length and breadth of this country. Madam Speaker, when I inherited the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports, the playing fields of our country were abandoned. Abandoned. Abandoned, and I had the pictures to prove it. Philippe Maslin, Olibo, Larry Seuss. All these fields were abandoned. Why don't you focus your energy on programming in such a way that it will take our country from the malaise that it is in? And you must understand that you cannot do it alone. You need the opposition to work in tandem with you in order to achieve the objectives you would have set for this country. But you're preoccupied with character assassination. Come and defame people. Come and attack my credibility. Call people names. That is what, you, that is what you, you, you're good for. But I'll tell you this, Madam Speaker. I am not one who encourages the politics of controversy. I came into the Ministry of Sports and National Lotteries. Not for once did I go public and say that I saw anything at lotteries that may not have been in conformity with the act and come here and speak about it or attempted to, 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 to defame anybody where that is concerned. I was able to get along with the work of my department and my ministry. And Madam Speaker, I am proud of my record as a Minister for Youth Development and Sports. I am proud of my record as a Minister for Youth Development and Sports. And after one year, after one year, the sportsmen and women in this country are complaining. Playing fields are abandoned again. There is no program at the community level. What do you have to show for one year? You'd be better off if you come into this honorable house. You need to go through a period of introspection. The campaign is over. You've won. You are ministers. You have a responsibility to this country. Go ahead and work for the country. Don't come here and try to assassinate people's character. That is not what you were elected for. You've secured the victory. Behave like ministers. Behave like individuals who have to play a lead role in moving this country forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister in the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Empowerment, Youth Development, Sports Culture, and Member for Denry South. Madam Speaker, um, I'd like to propose that we um, take a recess for lunch at this time. Honorable Minister, are you yielding to the Prime Minister? Yes, sir. He, he did. Oh, I asked him a question. Oh, my, my apologies, Madam Speaker. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Madam Speaker, I'm suggesting, I'm, I'm given the time, man. given the time um, that we can maybe break for lunch, I'm suggesting if we can maybe come back for two o'clock, Madam Speaker, if not two o five. Um, Leader of the opposition, two o five, two o'clock. Two o'clock is fifty minutes. Is that okay? Two o'clock, Madam Speaker. Honorable members, the question is that this house be suspended until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion say aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. All rise. And uh, we are now seeing that the House of Assembly has been suspended for a lunch break until 2 p.m. Uh, we are on the second motion on the order paper for today, and that motion uh, is that it be resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to raise a sum 
of EC103 million dollars uh, to finance the 2017-2018 budget and a sum of 262 million EC dollars for refinancing the existing debts on the regional government securities market or through private placements at a maximum rate of 7.5 percent. There are two more uh, money motions down for today before we head into the bill segment of the order paper where we expect one two three four bills to go through all its stages at this present sitting and one bill to go through first reading uh, it remains to be seen how the rest of the order paper will go for the afternoon session but uh, be sure to tune into the national television network at 2 p.m where we resume today's house of assembly proceedings from the government information service i am alicia ali and expediting budget